Thank you for being with us today. Take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of John, 21st chapter, and let's read together verses 4 through 7. John 21, verses 4 through 7. But when morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you caught any fish? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. You know, failure, it's really hard to deal with. It's hard to deal with for a number of reasons, but chief among them is it releases so many negative emotions. Emotions like shame, guilt, condemnation, embarrassment, frustration, and, and, and even fear. And if we don't deal with our failure, and if we don't deal with our, our emotions, it will cripple our faith. And if we're not careful, we'll be tempted to stop serving the Lord. Now, Simon Peter knows this to be very true. He knows it very well because he has big time failed, really big failure. And now he's wrestling with his emotions. And his negative emotions have all but crippled his faith. And it's left him in a fog of self-doubt. A few days after the resurrection, Peter and a few of the disciples decided to return up to Galilee and go fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And they did, and they, and they fished all night, and they didn't catch anything. But you know, I, I don't think Peter was too concerned about the empty nets. He was lost in his thoughts of just a few nights ago when he failed so miserably. Lost in his, you see, he remembered torches and Roman soldiers. He, he remembered a swinging sword and a, and a falling ear. He remembered a, a healing touch and a stern rebuke. He remembered Jesus warning him that he was going to run and hide. But he also remembered how he boasted that he wouldn't. But he did. He remembered warming himself by a fire in Caiaphas's courtyard, and, and he remembered being recognized. And he remembered saying, you're wrong. I don't even know that man. And then he remembered the rooster crowing. And he remembered turning and seeing Jesus looking at him. Oh, it's only a look that lasted for a moment, but... It's a look that's going to impact him for a lifetime. See, Peter's thoughts, they should have been on the resurrection. They, they should have been on the, the empty tomb and this dramatic defeat of death. But Peter could not shake the thought that Jesus had seen him fail again. Peter's life has now come full circle. <clears throat> Three years ago, he left the Sea of Galilee and he assumed he would never return again. But now he's back. Same sea, same boat, same nets, and most likely he's fishing in the same spots that he fished, fished three years ago. But it's different this time. It's different. Peter is not the same man that he was three years ago. See, three years with Jesus has changed him. He's seen too many miracles. And he's heard too much truth to ever be the same again. People wonder, well, what brought Peter back to the Sea of Galilee? What, why did he go back? And a lot of people think that he went back out of despair. And, and I have no challenge to that. I have no doubt that despair played a huge role in drawing him back to the Sea of Galilee. But perhaps it was something else. 
maybe it was something that, that stirred down deep in his heart, in his spirit. Maybe it was hope. Maybe Peter thought that by touching the place that it touched him with miracles, maybe that would help him deal with his failure. Maybe he thought that by going back to a place that was familiar to him, it would help him deal with his emotions. Well, whatever drew him back, the disciples sat in silence as the gentle waves rocked their boat. And it was going to be time to go ashore real soon. The sun would be rising. So the silence is broken by a stranger's voice from the shore. The stranger called out, Have you caught any fish? Now, this was not uncommon. People often came to the shore to ask the fishing boats as they were making their way back in, have you caught any fish? They, they wanted to be first in line to get the fresh fish. So the stranger calls out, have you caught any fish? We don't know who said it, but somebody in the boat yelled back, no. And the stranger then said, cast your net on the other side and you'll catch some. They probably looked at one another and, and, and thought, we have nothing to lose, one more cast, one more pull, and then we'll go in. And so they did. They cast their net on the other side, and as the net was slowly sinking below the water, that's when it happened. That's when it happened. There was a miracle catch of fish. A miracle catch of fish. Peter and the disciples, the others, they're pulling the net and they're trying to deal with this net full of fish. But John recognizes the stranger on the shore. Now, he didn't recognize him because he could see him. See, the, the pre-dawn darkness still covered the lake. No, John recognized the stranger on the shore because of the miracle catch of fish. It happened just like this three years ago when they first met Jesus. John taps Peter on the shoulder and he softly says to him, it's him. Peter, it's Jesus. Peter stands up and, and he can't see the shore, but he, he connects the dots, the, the miracle catch of fish. He pulls off his outer garment. He plunged into the chilly waters and he swam ashore. He was the first one to arrive. And by the time the, the, the other disciples arrived with their net of fish, Peter is standing silently, warming himself by a fire that Jesus had built to cook their breakfast. You know, I, I think it's important to notice what Peter did when he arrived on shore. See, both Peter and Jesus remembered the last time Peter warmed himself by the fire and what happened. They, they both remembered how Peter cursed and, and he, he said, I don't even know him. They both remembered that. So this time, Peter doesn't speak. He, he stands silently in the Lord's presence. I, I believe he's too repentant to speak, too ashamed of what he's done to say anything. But then again, he's too hopeful to walk away. You know, this is a moment that's almost too holy for words. Peter has failed. I mean, major failure. And yet Jesus has come to find him and to cook him breakfast. Jesus is going to offer Peter and the disciples a grace that they don't deserve. He's going to offer them the grace to try again. To try again. After breakfast, after breakfast, Jesus breaks the silence by asking Peter a question. 
He asked him a question. It's found recorded in verse 15 of chapter 21. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? I'll stop right there. Jesus asked Peter if he loved him. And, and the word that Jesus used for, for love was the, the Greek word agape, which means love of a divine quality. So Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me with a divine quality of love? Oh, Peter responds, and he assures Jesus that he loves him, but he doesn't try to match terms with Jesus. The word that Peter chose to use for love was the Greek word phileo, which means love of a friend. The love of a friend. Yes, Lord, I love you as a friend would love another. Oh, don't make the mistake. Don't make the mistake of thinking that, that Peter loves Jesus any less than he did before he failed. No, if anything, he loved him more. Peter's just deeply concerned that he's going to be able to keep any commitments that he makes to Jesus, especially in light of his recent failure. I, I think it's also important to notice the type of question that Jesus did not ask to Peter. He didn't ask anything like, hey, hey, Peter, the next time you find yourself under pressure, do you think you can keep from denying that you know me? Do you think? No, Jesus didn't ask anything like that. Actually, Jesus never brought up Peter's failure, nor the failure of the other disciples. It never was mentioned. Jesus only asked Peter one question. And he asked this question three times. Do you love me? Giving Peter three opportunities to affirm that he loved Jesus, each affirmation would bring healing to one of his denials. You know, Jesus never measures our potential by our past mistakes. And that's good news. That's really good. He doesn't measure our potential by our past mistakes. He measures our potential by the love that we're willing to exchange with him in the present. And here's why. See, he knows that if our love for him is still intact, if it's still in place, there's hope for us. And he knows that we have serious doubts about our ability to, to keep our commitments to him. But know this. It won't change his mind about his desire to use us. In this, in this narrative, we find that everything we do for God needs to flow, must flow, out of our love for Jesus. Jesus said, do you love me? Feed my lambs. In other words, he asked him three times, do you love me? Then serve me. Here's the secret. Love me first and then serve me. Love me first, and then serve me. And then Jesus did the unexpected. Nobody expected him to do this, do this it, especially Peter. He gave Peter a new assignment. He told him, feed my lambs. You know, I have no doubt that Peter assumed that he had so royally blown it that he would never again be given the opportunity to work with or for Jesus. I mean, he had really failed. He assumed he probably would never have any opportunity again. But see, he's about to see and discover the scope of the grace that Jesus is offering to him and to us even today. He's about to see He's about to see that his grace is bigger than his failure. You know, three years ago, Jesus said to Peter and the other disciples, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And they did. But now Jesus is saying to Peter, your fishing days are over. You're not coming back here again. 
now you're going to be a shepherd for me. You know, I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that Peter was deeply concerned about this new assignment. See, fishermen and shepherds, they're nothing alike. Fishermen can brag about the one that got away. Shepherds have to go out and find that one that's been lost. Fishermen can do their job and not even get their feet wet. But shepherds who do their job correctly, they can't even keep their feet clean. Your fishing days are over. Now you're going to be a shepherd for me. Now, Jesus said, do you love me? And then he added this little phrase, do you love me more than these? Now, the Bible is silent as to what Jesus was referencing when he added that statement, more than these. Most theologians speculate that he was probably talking about the boats and the nets and the marketplace and the sea and, and the fishing business. We don't know. The Bible is silent. But what Jesus is telling Peter, you're concerned about your new assignment, but here's how you make it successful. Here's how you make it successful. Do you love me more than these? Do not love anything or anyone more than you love me. Don't love anything or anyone more than you love me. Always put me first in your heart. Let me ask a very personal question of you. What if Jesus asked you that same question right now? What, what if he asked you, what or who do you love more than you love me? Now, you don't have to struggle too hard to find the answer. It's, it's right there. It's obvious. What you love more or who you love more than you love Jesus is whatever takes his place in your heart and whatever steals his time with you. Whatever takes his place in your heart and whatever steals his time with you, that's what you love more. Do you love me more than these? Let me, let me ask another question. Can you honestly say before God that you've totally surrendered your life and your future into his hands? Can, can you say that and you mean it? See, here, here's what I'm, why I'm asking. Because Peter's obedience and surrender to God's will for his life, countless millions have come to Christ. They come to know Christ because of his surrender to God's will for his life. I wonder, I wonder who is waiting on you to surrender to God's will for your life? Who's waiting on you to surrender so they can find him and find his love and find his mercy and find his forgiveness? See, here's an inconvenient truth, my friend. Listen, until you fully surrender to God's will, God's plan for your life will be put on hold. And if God's plan for your life has been put on hold, then all the people that you're supposed to reach for Him, they're going to be impacted by your reluctance or your failure or your resistance to surrender to God's will and plan for your life. Maybe, maybe today you're like Peter. You failed. Not just a little one. I mean, you, you failed. You, you did a big one. You failed. And now you're battling your emotions and they're, they're tearing you up. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Whatever your failures may be, and regardless of how badly you failed, don't quit. I'm telling you, don't quit. Don't give up. Regardless of how many promises you've broken and how many times you've stumbled. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't walk away. I'll tell you why. If you'll repent of whatever you've done 
And if you'll come to Him, He's always ready to forgive you and to offer you what He offered to Peter and those disciples on that day. He'll offer you the grace to try again. He doesn't measure your potential by your failure. He measures your potential by the love you're willing to exchange with Him today. Oh, listen, I, I, I pray, I pray that you'll not walk away regardless of what you've done, regardless of how you may have failed. It's not bigger than His grace, I promise you. L let me pray for you. My Father, I, I come to you in Jesus' name and I bring my friends with me. And Lord, you know, you know that some, some have, they've blown it, they've failed, just like Peter did 2,000 years ago. And they're struggling now with their, their emotions. Their emotions are tearing them up on the inside. Their faith is getting crippled and, and they're struggling hard not to yield to that desire to quit serving you just because they don't think they can stay the course. My Father, I pray, speak to their heart. Speak to their heart. Draw them to you. Reassure them that you've not changed your mind about loving them or, or using them and that your grace that you offer to them, it will change everything. And it'll give them the opportunity to try again. To try again. God, I ask you, meet my friend at the point of their need. Do in them and for them what they cannot do for themselves. And I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your mercy. And Lord, I really thank you for your grace. Thank you for giving us the grace to try again. I offer you my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for listening to this week's message. To stay up to date, please like us on Facebook at Touching Africa Ministries or visit our website at touchingafricaministries.org. If you would like to give online, head to touchingafricaministries.org slash donate.